I'm going to talk about multi-factor authentication and how it uh, comes to, um, and actually about the relationship between uh, MFA and uh, asterisk. Um, quick intro, um, my name is Or. I work uh, as a research engineer at Forter. Forter provides uh, fraud prevention for e-commerce companies. And um, my job there is to help and find new ways to um, stop credit card fraud online. Um, it's uh, very far from uh, asterisk as a day to day. Before I got into this position, I worked with uh, Greenfield Tech. They're uh, sponsoring and presenting in this conference. And I worked there on uh, VoIP SDK. Um, before that, um, I'm using Asterisk uh, since uh, 2009. That's about eight years now. Um, it started, I worked as a, um, as a paralegal in a, um, a law office in Israel. And we didn't have a PBX in there. So I was reading around and, uh, oh, what do you know? There's this thing called asterisk, we can install it and we'll have a PBX and I won't have to yell to the lawyer to pick up the phone when I'm answering the phone. Um, and yeah, this is like, this is uh, my third Astrocon. Um, I've been presenting in the conference uh, for the past uh, three years. And that's uh, kind of my, you know, my hobby now, um, since it's not part of my day-to-day -day work. Um, Basically, the system at Forder provides decisions to the customer. So that means if you have um, a website and you sell computers, um, in order to have your, in order to sell your computers only to legitimate users and not uh, end up both without the money and without the computer, online e uh, online credit card transactions are not insured. That means that if you didn't verify the identity of the user. Um, someone gave you his credit card, if he's not the, the card owner, then you're not insured. And how can you verify it online? It's, uh, you know, you don't meet the person and you don't have a lot of um, automated tools to do that. Uh, Forte gives you the solution. And we also cover um, phone orders. So that's, I think, as close as it gets to um, asterisk and VoIP and telephone in general. But that's about it. Um, so, in my day-to-day, -day, I always try to find ways that uh, Asterisk and um, uh, our work could go together. And one of them is the multi-factor authentication, and I'll ju get right to it. So, <coughs> we're going to talk about multi-factor authentication. I'll give a quick brief of the common ways to implement it and how basically things work today. Um, after that, we'll talk a bit about how you can use multi-factor authentication to protect your asterisk system and your systems in general. And I'll also show how asterisk can help you automate and bypass multi-factor authentication. And we'll talk about why it's such a great tool um, and how you can use it to do lots of things that are not related to asterisk directly. And then we'll have time to talk a bit about the future and uh, have a Q&A. So basically, multi-factor authentication, and I'm just going to call it MFA from now. Um, it's uh, a way, it's actually a, a concept that requires you to, it actually requires the user to possess at, at least two things in order to authenticate your system. So it can be, the, We'll talk about it uh, a bit more soon, but usually you're asking for the user to something he knows and then something he has. So let's say if I'm logging to a website, then I know the password. And when the website is uh, sending me an SMS verification, he asks me for uh, something that I have because I have the phone with me. So these are two factors. And two-factor authentication is this exact kind of authentication. You're trying to log. You give a password, you get one-time SMS code, you enter that one too. These are two factors, and then you're authenticated. Um, Multi-factor is at least two factors, but it can be more than two factors. Um, and we'll also get to that soon. Um, why is it good? Why is it helping to anyone? 
Um, in general, I'm assuming that you want to protect your system, and just protecting it with even a really good password is not enough. Um, I don't know how often you change your passwords, and I don't know if you make sure to use strong password or a password manager to generate those, but even if you have a really good password, that's far from being enough. It stays the same, it doesn't change, and every time you log in, you use the same password. So if someone acquired your password, it can be through phishing, it could be through you know, um, gaining access to your computer, he can use that password again to log into your system and do pretty much everything he wants. So uh, when you have two-factor or multi-factor, you're, in fact, when you have it in place, then you're requiring your users or yourself, for example, to have access to multiple um, multiple authentication methods. Okay, so let's say if you're logging to your AWS console, it will always ask you for both your password and your two-factor authentication. And that's good because if a hacker or an attacker wants to gain access to your AWS account, he has to both gain access to your computer, and that's a very difficult task to do, as is. But just getting access to your computer is not enough because he'll have to hack your phone too and get the verification code from your authenticator app or um, you know, um, gain access to your SMS and get the code that you're getting by SMS. So um, the thing is that if you separate those factors, you have, the, you have a really good password in your password manager, and then you have on a different device, on your cell phone, you have an authenticator app that generates codes every 30 seconds, then that attacker needs to access both of these. And in general, more factors, which are separated physically, um, are a better protection to your account. And that's all in the slides, pretty much. <laughs> Um, there are a few common practices for uh, multi-factor um, authentication. You have the first one, which is, that's not a good factor, okay? You have four or six digits pin code. And, you know, um, when you're accessing uh, and when you're accessing the GoDaddy's website, I think, then it asks you for your password, and then it asks you for a four-digit pin code. And these are not two separate factors. These are both passwords, it, it's you know pretty much the same as you'll have a really long password and you'll separate it into two different text fields online. Um, so it stays the same as password, and if I hacked your computer once and you know I've intercepted it from the web page, then I can just use it again to log in as you and do whatever I want in your account. I can sell your domains to someone, I can transfer them to my, uh, my uh, position, etc. So, this is not a different factor. It's same as password, and I've added the list of um, good and bad things about each uh, method, and you can see them here. So, it can also be guessed, because these are four digits, and, or six digits, and uh, stay the same. So, it's exposed to brute force attacks, etc. The next method, which is a bit better, um, is SMS verification and automated phone calls. Uh, we are talking about, again, few digits code that is generated every, hopefully, uh, every login attempt. And you can get them either by SMS or by an application calling to you and saying, hey, your verification code is four digits. And I marked it as, uh, first of all, it is a different factor because you do need your phone for it. So. If someone uh, hacks your computer, that's not enough. He's going to have to hack, hack your phone. Um, there is one problem with it. Since it's phone-based, it, it is exposed to attacks that are relevant for phones, which means your phone number can be hijacked. Um, you know, someone can call AT&T and say, uh, hey, I lost my SIM card. Can you please send me a new one? And today, these attacks are still applicable. They work. Um, AT&T might, you know, go uh, make you go through some uh, physical verification. Hey, send us a picture of your government ID. Send us uh, a utility bill to prove this is you. But all of these can be achieved or faked. So when I'm saying um, that it probably can't be brute forced and probably can't be guessed, that depends on the algorithm that generates the codes. So 
you know, everyone implements his uh, one-time password differently. Um, if it would be me, I'll go with probably the easiest option, and I'll just generate, I don't know, um, four-digit code and send it to the user. You know, what could possibly happen? So uh, there is not a real standard to do it, and that's also a problem. But it's heading the right direction because these are two separate physical factors to access a system. Um, and then you have the much better option of authenticator apps and physical security tokens. These are devices that generate a six-digit code that changes every 30 seconds. And the good thing about it is that it, can, it can't really be brute forced. That really depends on the system, but uh, as far as I know, 60 second, uh, 30 seconds are not enough to try all the combinations that you have because you have one million combinations. And um, when you're putting, let's say you own the website that requires the multi-factor authentication, you, know, you could limit the user to a certain number of attempts per minute. So it's much better. It can't really be brute forced. And can it be reused once it's achieved? Um, so let's say someone stole your phone. If, you, if your phone is not secured with the password, is not secured with the fingerprint um, sensor, then yeah, someone got your password, now he stole your phone, he can use the authenticator app on your phone to get the code, obviously. Um, but as long as you're protecting your phone with the passcode, or um, you know, if it was deleted, then you immediately wipe the device and generate a new token for your account, then it can't really be it can't be reused. So this is a much better option. And in general, the authenticator apps are harder, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's much harder to physically steal them because the way that um, those apps are written, um, it's, uh, it's meant to be that, for example, in Google Authenticator, you can't export your um, account. You can't transfer the code generator to a different device. If you want to um, move to a new device, a new cell phone, then you have to disable the multi-factor authentication using your previous app and then uh, reconfigure it with your new device. And then there's my personal favorite. Oh, okay. Sorry. These are examples for uh, authenticator apps. Um, on the right, you have uh, Google's, um, it's called Google Prompt. Okay, it's now replacing the six-digit code generator that they had on Authenticator. It uses the Google app on your device to just send you a push notification when you're trying to log in, and it's asking you, are you trying to sign in from that device? And you can say yes or no, and again, this is the same thing as entering six, dig six digits, because still, it's on your phone, and it's completely separate from your computer. Um, in the middle, you have Okta's, um, six-digit code generator. Okta is uh, a single sign-on provider and also a multi-factor generator app. They have a great SDK. And this is actually what we're using for Forder for certain applications. So in the middle, you have their um, six-digit option. And that code generates again with 30 seconds. And on the left, you have a screenshot from my uh, smartwatch that shows their push notification capabilities. So also, you're getting a push notification to your cell device. You can choose approve, deny, and that's about it. <coughs> I'm sorry. OK. This one is my personal favorite. Um, it's the password protected password manager as a second factor, which is basically more than additional factor. Um, you do have the uh, um, Google Authenticator capabilities, which means um, your smart uh, password manager can generate codes, okay? And I'm gonna demo it for a second. Um, I'm using 1Password as a password manager, and it has the capability to, let's see if I can move it here. Oh, no, it's on full screen. So, yeah. What's wrong? Okay, that's weird. Let's <laughs> step out of this for a second and we'll move over. Okay. Uh, 
there's nothing as good as issues with live presentation. <laughs> okay, so this is my password manager, um, and I have here Astrocom demo. Okay, um, as you can see, there are six digits uh, code generator that changes every few seconds, and basically it's exactly the same. Sorry, it's exactly the same as the Google Authenticator. Um, it simply lets you add it into your password manager. So it's you know more easy to manage it, and there is one downside to using password manager over Authenticator app, and that is that mine is uh, synced to uh, a cloud storage. Okay, they claim their password manager is better than two-factor because you have a really long account key, and then you have your own uh, secret passphrase. Um, and again, it's a different uh, store of passwords, but it is a bit um, a bit weaker than you know having a dedicated app on a separate physical device. Um, but it does the trick. So um, when I'm saying that it's more than just a second factor, I really mean that you know in order to get access to the the token itself, the self-regenerating token, I have to both have the um, password manager installed, both know the very long secret key it has, enter my password, and then I can access the second factor. So obviously, if I'm placing both my password to the website and the um, one-time password at the same password manager, that logic uh, fails. You know? I just need to gain access to the password manager. So I'm, trying, I'm doing my best to separate them. Um, I think this is the best balanced method because um, it, it gives you all the advantages that uh, multi-factor gives you. Uh, you know, it can't be guessed, it can't be brute forced, it's a different factor. And you know, once someone, um, if someone gained access to my password manager, then he'll still need the, either my fingerprint or, um, you know, have my password, but I can always just re-encrypt the, the vault itself. So um, having password protected password manager over um, an authenticator app is a bit better. These are examples to basically all the um, um, password managers, not all, some of them that uh, I know and I can tell you that they have the multi-factor authentication capabilities. And <coughs> Last but not least, <laughs> this is an option that I'm sure um, people won't like. Uh, you could use voice biometrics as a, a second factor. Um, you know, uh, when, I, when I call my bank, actually, they, they ask me to say a certain phrase, um, like uh, fuzzy wuzzy was a bear, uh, out loud in order to verify it's me. So they have my voice signature and they're asking me to identify with it in order to be able to make uh, actions on my, f on my account over the phone. So this is a different factor. I think this is the single um, factor that currently can't be stolen. Um, we're heading there, obviously, uh, when biometrics will be um, as popular as other means of security today, then people you know, try to go James Bond on you and record a sample of your voice and then synthesize it. But I don't think we're there yet. Um, so this is like the only method that is protected from physically being stolen. <sighs> okay, protecting your asterisk. Um, this uh, actually, the whole idea of this presentation came from the Israeli, um, I'm from Israel by the way, <laughs> the Israeli um, VoIP meetup, which is again organized by Greenfield Tech, uh, Nir and Eric. They try to make uh, monthly meetings. and. I'm obviously going to these meetings, and we had uh, a guy which was uh, new, uh, new to Asterisk, but uh, he's an IT guy for a company that has offices in, I think, 30 or 40 locations over the world, and he came to us and he said, listen, I have this really interesting problem, maybe you'll be able to help me. And he said that he has, uh, his company has an office in a certain country in Africa, and this country is, this location is the only location that generates really high phone bills. And we said, okay, that makes sense, but go on. 
And then he told us that uh, the local workers in that office, which are not uh, employees of the Israeli company, but you know, the cleaning guy and the security guard from downstairs, um, they're using the phone to make calls to their homes. Um, so they're calling all sorts of countries all over the world, and you know, it gets as high as uh, $4 a minute. And we told him, okay, what's the problem? Uh, add the pin code. And he said, yeah, we tried that. And then uh, the cleaning guy just asked one of our employees, what's the pin code? And he told him. So we moved over to tell him, OK, lock the doors. What's the problem? He said, no, no, you don't understand. In this country, if you're locking the door, you're disrespecting the local employees. So they'll break the door, and they'll make the phone calls anyway. And then he said, OK, uh, what do you want to do? Then he said, you know, it would be really nice if I could um, lock the extension. And only when the extension's real user um, want to make a call, then you'll have to enter a uh, changing pin code. Uh, so he didn't know, the, I mean, he probably knew or met at least once in his life the concept of multi-factor, but he didn't know how to name it. And we were like, oh, OK, multi-factor authentication. What's the problem? He said, how do you do that? So I guess uh, how many of you here have Asterisk experience? Everyone. Uh, how many of you wrote a dial plan before? Everyone, pretty much. So how would you do that? You'll have a multi-factor code generator, and then you'll add this uh, small line that checks that the code the user entered matches the multi-factor authentication, right? So, <laughs> so simple. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you just that. It's, you know, it's more, more to, it's pretty simple, but uh, I think it's worth seeing it in, uh, in, you know, in your own eyes, um, how easy it is to do that. So what I have here, and I think at this point I'll just cancel the screen mirroring. <coughs> okay. Now I can look at my own computer. Do you still hear me? It's okay. Do I need to use the mic? Cool. So. Um, I can try doing that and speaking a bit louder. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I think these demos uh, are worthwhile because all everything I'm showing you is uh, inside uh, an asterisk Docker container, and this is like a, a hot topic for the past few years. I am also going to speak today at 3 p.m. about deploying your asterisk. Um, everywhere and anywhere, in any public cloud. And I'm going to show how you deploy Dockerized Asterisk. Um, so these examples are all uh, going together with uh, 3 o'clock stock. Uh, but you can follow just fine. Um, so I'm going to enter presentation mode. And this is our nice dial plan. Okay, It doesn't, have, it doesn't do much. It answers, and it uh, asks you for password. And then it gives you 30 seconds to enter your password. And once you've entered the password, it asserts that the password you've entered matches a password from a code generator. And the code generator is on a different session. I'm sorry. I have to exit and switch over to this one. OK. Um, I'll try to make it a bit bigger, too. OK. Basically, um, the Authenticator app is generating a secret key. And then it, pro it uh, shows you a QR code that you scan into your Authenticator app. And it's basically just a 32 bytes secret key. OK. The key stays the same. And I know it. The other party knows that key. It's not like uh, um, a PKI. It's completely different. We both know the exact same secret. And we can, um, you have two types of one-time password. You have count-based and you have time-based. Uh, count-based is I'm always maintaining a, a counter. And every time I'm generating a password, um, I'm advancing this counter by one. Um, this one is, um, It's. I think it's, not as good as the time-based, because obviously the counters can go out of sync. 
Um, the time based generates uh, a password um, using the current time timestamp, basically. And if both systems' clocks are synchronized, you'll always get the same value. Um, so in the dial plan, I'm running uh, this file that is called uh, OTP um, generator, no, OTP token.py. This is the content of the file. So you basically could do it in three lines instead of uh, 13 that I used. Um, so you're just uh, creating a new PyOTP um, class instance uh, with your secret key. Okay, so obviously if I wanted to do it to, uh, if I wanted to add this capability to a um, real PBX, then I'll have one secret key per one extension, and you know, um, when I'm checking the current uh, token, I'll just give <coughs> the extension number, and then according to that, I'll know what secret key to use. Um, so there is the secret key, and then to get the password, I'm simply calling dot now, which generates the code based on the current timestamp. So that's about it. It could have been two lines of Python code, um, but I try to make it a bit uh, nicer. Okay, now back to the dial plan. <sighs> Sorry about all the fuss with the presentation mode. So I'm answering, I am asking the user to enter his password, and then I'm executing the, this Python script, and I'm saving it to a variable called OTP value. Okay? If the OTP value matches the user value that the user just entered, then I'll play the wonderful sounds of uh, TT monkeys, uh, which you'll soon hear. And if it's not matching, then I'll just uh, jump to the um, goodbye message. So we're going to see it um, right now. This is uh, a dockerized asterisk. Okay, it's a Docker container, basically. And I'm running a uh, bash on it. Oh, it's really, really small. I'm sorry. Is it better? <laughs> so, um, I'm going to log into asterisk and I'm going to do dial plan reload because I just removed an unnecessary comma from there. Okay, so I've prepared in advance a demo token, asterisk on demo. So, this is my um, changing password, my single factor authentication, and obviously the, the first factor of the authentication is the SIP extension credentials. Okay, so I need to know the, uh, I know the username and the password, and I'm authenticated against the asterisk, and now the purpose is to protect the asterisk from making unauthorized phone calls. Uh, so I'm going to call that extension, and we're going to see what's going on. Okay, so now it's asking for password. I'll just enter something that um, I don't know. Goodbye. So you see that uh, there wasn't a match because the user value was uh, just a random int I've entered and the OTP value was a different thing. And now, uh, and brace yourselves because the TT Monkeys uh, sound file is, uh, <laughs> let's say it's exotic, <laughs> okay? So, I'm calling again, and this is obviously simulating an outgoing call. Password. Now it's asking me for the password, and you see that it's just about to change, and it was changed. So I'm entering 385-446, and we got the monkey. Yes. <laughs> it's working, as simple as that. Um, it's a very basic demo, but the, the whole purpose is to show you how simple it is. And I think the distance from taking those few lines of code and you know combining them with your whatever fraud prevention solution if you're using, let's say you're using Humbug Labs and it generates alerts, or let's say that you're just using the most simple uh, on-off hours restriction on your system, uh, you could add another factor of security to protect your accounts from you know just physically accessing the phone and dialing whatever exotic um, destination you might want. Uh, okay, we're gonna go back to presentation mode. Actually, I don't think there's a need. Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about Selenium. Uh, anyone of you here knows what Selenium is? 
Oh, that's awesome. Uh, uh, so for those of you who doesn't know, um, Selenium is a browser automation tool. It basically gives you a simple interface in multiple uh, languages. You have uh, Python, you have Java, you have Node.js, and it lets you program uh, programmatically control a browser. You could navigate, you could uh, enter certain account details to fields, you could uh, press purchase. Uh, people are using it to um, create unit tests and end-to-end -end tests for their websites. Um, this is a tool that I'm using uh, regularly in Photo, obviously. And I, th I thought that I could use that uh, tool in order to um, basically automate multi-factor authentication flows. Um, the internet is filled with people asking, uh, hey, I'm using this uh, Salesforce users model, and I'm trying to create an end-to-end -end test. And every time I'm trying to log in, it wants to send me an SMS. It wants to make an automated phone call to me. How do I end-to-end -end test this flow? And the answer is, you don't. <laughs> That's what Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow are filled with. These are the answers. Uh, you can't uh, automate test uh, a phone call. Uh, it's too complicated. It's too difficult. Um, just set a test profile, and whenever you're using the unit test, skip that part. OK, so if you're doing it, how is that exactly an end-to-end -end test? Uh, it's not. So this is, um, I think, the best example of why you need asterisk to automate these kind of flows. Uh, Amazon's phone verification, uh, not just calling you and providing you the code, because you know I could do that probably with uh, any automated uh, transcript API. I could just send a call to a voicemail and then get the voicemail transcript and get the code from there. Amazon are asking you to actively insert a six digit code. So asterisk is perfect for that. I'm not going to demonstrate that flow. I'm just going to demonstrate, actually not going to demonstrate it with asterisk at all. I'm just going to show you how easy it is to receive a phone call and transcript it. Because this is the part that most people find difficult. So <clears throat> what we have here is, um, and I'm going to drop the mic again. We have here another dial plan. Okay. Um, this is a more simple one, uh, and I won't zoom in because it's five lines. Basically, I'm answering plain VM goodbye for some reason. Uh, I don't remember why. <laughs> and then I'm recording the current call into a file in a specific location. Um, that location is mapped to my hosting machine from the Docker container, but again, it could be um, I didn't even get to the area of uh, you know orchestrating everything and uh, making it scalable out of the box for you, because I don't think it's necessary. Everyone has their own way that they are uh, synchronizing tasks, and they'll prefer hosting recordings in their own way. So I'm just showing the, the, the gist of it. It's very simple. So I'm answering the channel. I am recording the message into a certain file, and then I'm going to use a different Python script to um, transcribe that specific uh, call. So. Um, What's going to happen now is I'm going to hit, um, oops, sorry about that. I think I, whew. there it is. OK. So once again, dial plan, reload. I'm using the same uh, phone number to dial because I'm roaming. so. What I have now is, um, sorry again, OK. So we have uh, this folder. Uh, you've seen I'm recording it to temp slash recording. That's the folder that the recording is going to be saved at. So um, this is the mapped, um, the mapped folder to my host machine. I'm running on the computer itself, not inside the Docker at the moment. And if you open the um, latest, uh, latest record, then you'll hear me just uh, mumbling about stuff. <laughs> so um, let's run the transcript script, Python site login. Um, I'm going to show the script in a second. Basically, all I'm doing is I'm sending the file to Google's um, transcript API. It's called Google Speech API, actually. Okay. So um, 
Here the message was, this is a demo from Selenium conference. Sorry, this is a demo planned for the future uh, conference. And the, your verification code is uh, those four digits. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to edit the code generator, okay? And um, next move, fund verification. Okay. So. This is an example for how you would um, add phone verification call to your website. Okay, so you'll probably use uh, a service like Nexmo or Twilio or whatever, and you'll ask them to call the user and read in the following message. So let's say that I want to create a six digits code, and this is the code that I've just generated. I could use uh, the pi one time password here just as, as much, doesn't really matter. And, but just a random. And what's going to happen now is that I'm going to run that specific um, Nexmo phone verification, and we're going to see what's going on inside the asterisk. So, wonderful. <laughs> Sorry about that. Python, Nexmo phone verification. Okay. So the request to Nextmo was sent, and as you can see, uh, I've answered the, the call inside asterisk, and the recording is saved to latest record. Um, and when I'm trying, obviously when I'm automating, then the phone call will come from the service I'm trying to access, and he'll provide me the code, and all I have to do is to transcribe it. Uh, to transcribe it. I'm sorry. So. Um, if you can remember, the previous code was one, two, two, three. Now I got a, a new code. I'll just run the transcript script and send to Google, return in. Should take about uh, five seconds, and as you can see, it tra it transcribed the new code. Um, so it's it's working. the The whole concept is very simple, um, just for automating it. Um, that's about it for automating uh, MFA flows. You, can, you could use this exact, you know, all the code here, you can just take it and copy it into one Python class and then you'll be able to, you know, automatically log, log into Google, log into Facebook. Um, I also have a proof of concept of automatically logging into Facebook with a um, changing uh, token, changing one-time password. Uh, I could show it to you later if you want, but I don't think it's relevant. So the thing is that since it's so easy to be done using all the great tools you have today, and I think it took me like 10, 15 minutes to have a working proof of concept, you need to find better ways to protect your system. And you know, it's, it, that's where it, it gets uh, challenging. So basically, you as a, I don't know, um, um, an IT um, staff or you know, a systems engineer, you need to find the best balance between adding those security means and annoying your users. Okay, so uh, let's say that you want to protect your asterisk. Don't ask the the user to enter his one-time password every phone call he's trying to make. Um, if he was authenticated successfully, you know, keep a record with a TTL for 30 minutes. And if he didn't make any other phone calls in those uh, 30 minutes, then just revoke his uh, authentication. And when he's, when he'll try to call again, then ask him to authenticate again. Um, so, you know, you really need to find that uh, that balance, and you can you can make more requests for authentication when the people. Sorry, when the user wants to, you know, do dangerous things. So let's say at Forder, when I'm connecting to a server that runs in production, uh, it's not enough just uh, that I have the SSH key and I have the password. The system also asks me to enter one-time password in order to gain um, shell access to the machine in production. So that's you know, it, it, 
it's a mean of security that it, it's annoying for uh, for me as a developer or DevOps uh, personnel or whatever, but it helps protecting the machine. And yep, that's what I said. F you just need to find the balance. It's a very thick line between you know being uh, overprotective and doing it just in the right amount. Um, there are plenty of great solutions today. Uh, you have many of single sign-on providers. You don't need to be the expert yourself. Um, you can use Okta, you can go, you know, don't listen to me, just do your own reading. Um, go online, read about single sign-on providers, SSO providers. It's, you know, it, it's, it's so complicated. If you want to really protect your system, it's not enough just to ask for a password and ask for a multi-factor authentication. You have a OWASP's uh, list of all the things you need to do in order to handle passwords correctly, like hashing it in your database and um, what algorithm to use and stuff like that. And you don't need to, to be an expert. I mean, be a telecom expert. Leave the, the whole idea of handling authentication to the people that this is their core business. I mean, I, I don't even know if everything I do is correct. Um, this is more like uh, future thoughts that I tried to draft uh, on paper. Um, my personal belief is that uh, the market is going to use more and more, uh, you know, third-party uh, authentication services. Um, you know, logging into websites with Facebook and Google is much more common today than it was four years ago. I mean, I think uh, one of the few services you could log in with Google four years ago was, you know, Google Plus. That was the <laughs> pretty much the height of it. Um, yeah, you have, you know, tons of, of new uh, ventures and, and ideas in that area. Uh, there is this company, um, I have to see the notes. Yeah, it's called Biocatch, okay? It's uh, basically using your phone's um, sensors and the way you hold it in your hand. Just that, it doesn't use anything else. It uses the way you hold your phone in your hand to create a fingerprint of you and authenticate you into the phone. So you could, you know, just raise the phone and you'll be authenticated. It will know it's you. Uh, apparently no one holds their phone the same way as someone else does. And this is, you know, it's, it's insane. It's really cool. And you have uh, Apple's new Face ID coming into the market. You have Touch ID. All of these are things that you can, you know, utilize. And uh, I think that's where the market is going. And the, um, hopefully we'll have a world w without fraud, uh, where people won't try to take over accounts and, you know, won't try to do harm. But I think we're a bit far from there. And you know, I, I think that having this kind of services, Facebook doesn't really need to ask you for a password. They know you better, probably better than you know yourself. And, you know, that there was, a, I just read an article two days ago about uh, someone who found out his daughter was pregnant because he started receiving coupons for pregnant, pregnant girls. Okay, so he called, uh, he called the, um, I think it was Target, he called them and he told them, listen, you started sending me uh, Brighton women's coupons. That that's insane. No one's Brighton in this house. Why would you come to? Why would you jump to that conclusion? And I told them, listen, it's the system that does that. Uh, we didn't do anything. And two months ago, he found out that his daughter was Brighton, and she didn't even know. So this is really cool. <laughs> this is, I think, it's it's pure machine learning. So. We're going. We are heading there with uh, authentication and account protection, and I think um, Forte does this kind of things too. But we're not a single sign-on provider. Um, that's where we are going. So you know, keep it in mind. Try to go there yourselves and make sure nobody steals phone calls from your asterisk. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>